Unfortunately, she won't say nearly the nice things about herself that I would. So welcome. This is one of two uh, summer scholar lectures we have in the department this summer. There may be more. Um, we have a research summer scholar and we have a clinical summer scholar. In fact, we're always a clinical summer, summer scholar, meaning that the profoundness of her experience is in clinical um, training. And she has, uh, is the director of, or sorry, department chair of the Counseling Psychology Program at Boise State University in Boise, Idaho. So we're very happy to have her here. And she's also teaching Family 545 uh, CMPS course. Um, also, just to let you know a little bit about her background, she got a PhD from Oregon State. Uh, those are not the ducks. They are the ducks? Beavers. The beavers. <laughs> I hope beavers. Um, she also has. Um, Number three, license for marriage and family trained uh, therapy in the state of Idaho. Number three, the lower you go, the easier you're like a number. And on the very bottom ground, she also is the only certified career counselor in the state of Idaho. She's um, chair of the ethics task force for the state of Idaho. Plus, she also sits on the um, um, punitive committee, if you violate ethics, for the American Counseling Association. She has numerous publications, numerous books, thousands of presentations. So I think that um, her experience in both um, mindfulness, meditation, spirituality, ethics, marriage and family training, and school counselor training is going to be a delight for us this morning. So thank you. Uh, thank what you. we'll do is we'll hear from um, Bobby for about an hour. And then we'll have a few minutes for question and answer, if that's all right. And then if you're still eager to speak to her afterwards, I'll cut it off at about 12.20. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, it only comes after you have lived for many years that you get those many things uh, listed. So just know that your time will come as well. Um, but I have been interested in this topic, spirituality and counseling, for about 15 years. When I first, um, please come in. Please welcome. I, um, I, be, I uh, initiated the, the first course in spirituality and counseling at Boise State just because I really felt that there was a need and that it wasn't being addressed. And coincidentally, this is uh, kind of when the, there was a, a, an increased uh, surge of interest in the area of spirituality, integrated spiritu spirituality and religion and counseling, um, just in the country. And so um, I also come to you as... Um, as just a person who um, practices centering prayer, which is a form of Christian meditation. I do yoga. Um, I belong to a mainline church, um, although I have pretty liberal views. And um, I would tell you that I am come from Christian perspective, but I also have a lot of interest in Buddhist teachings. And so that's, that's kind of my background. So we'll get started. And the first thing that I want you to think about is when you hear the word spirituality and religion, what is your response? How do you feel about that? What just kind of comes to mind when you think about that? And um, just reflect on that just for a moment. And I would tell you that we're all going to have individual responses and individual reactions based on possibly our past experiences and our belief systems. And so, again, just since the mid-90s, this integration of spirituality and religion in, in the clinical work and many has, has generated interest. And there are uh, many authors that are writing on this topic now and many um, assessments that have been developed around this time period. And I'm going to just, what I'm going to do is take you through a three-credit course in 45 minutes, okay? So this is like an overview of what you might learn were you to take a spirituality and counseling course. But we'll try to give some case examples for you to consider as well. So I want you to think about just for a minute, why do clients come for counseling? Um, I just kind of threw up a list and I thought of several more. Um, so think about this. They come from grief and loss. Um, maybe they've experienced a chronic illness or are dying perhaps. They've had trauma or abuse, um, relationship issues, however they might manifest themselves. Some crises that was unforeseen or tragedy that was unavoidable has occurred. What else would you add to this list? Uh, anxiety and depression came up immediately for me this one. It's like, oh, I left that off. What else? Can you think of others? Oh, career. Career. Career um, uh, change life questions. Yeah. Try figuring out your calling, your vocation, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Career development issues. What else? 
I thought we'd just kind of have a back and forth. We would talk a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> put your thinking cap on here, okay? Yes. In pending retirement. Sure. Uh huh. Yeah. Life transitions. Um, not any. How about family developmental transitions? Anything else that just pops into your mind that you think, oh, maybe they have uh, anorexia or you know, very specific. difficulties and that some clients really require very clear methods and techniques such as we might find in cognitive behavior therapy and that's what works for them and, and that's really a good thing and that's something that, that as counselors and therapists we can offer but some may need something else they may need just a space to consider what the meaning and purpose of their life is or or uh, just to be able to listen to themselves and uncover what they already know or what the soul knows. And spiritual, spirituality or religion might be an important part of their lives that if we were to ask the question, we might uncover the, um, the, uh, that belief system and how that operates in their lives, how that helps them function in their lives. And so these are kind of some of the universal questions that uh, spirituality, religion, and transpersonal psychology attempt to answer. So you might just think about that. Have you ever found yourself asking these questions? Why am I here? Where is true meaning? Or what's the meaning and purpose of life? Why am I suffering? Why is there suffering at the end of life? Where is there hope? Give some strength. And I would invite you um, at this moment just now to think for yourself of a time in your past that maybe you um, uh, had to be concerned with one of the issues that I just had when I said, well, here are the reasons clients come to, ca to, to counseling. Think of a time in your life that maybe you were questioning, there was a, a transition that happened, maybe uh, unavoidable crisis occurred in your family and think about think about that time and then think about what gave you hope during that time what gave you a source of strength during that time and we're going to try to consider those questions in terms of these areas so we need to kind of start out and I, I love definitions I always carry a dictionary around with me I'm kind of a nerd that way and so I get to carry away uh, definitions, but really um, the root word for spirituality in different languages means wind, breath, or air. We often see it as breath, the breath of life. Okay? Um, spirituality can be defined as a sense of energy, essence, vitality, awareness, or consciousness. Sometimes we talk about the transformation of consciousness. And it may include one's values, beliefs, mission, awareness. Subjective experience and sense of purpose. So here again, you see the um, awareness, sense of purpose. And two more definitions, or one, one more. Spirituality strives for inspiration, reverence, awe, meaning, and purpose. It tries to be in harmony with the universe and strives for answers about the infinite. And once again, we see that it really begins to come into focus when a person is facing uh, some kind of emotional difficulty or stress, or um, uh, chronic illness perhaps, or, or just uh, being made aware of your own mortality or, or actually a loved one's death. So this, this is kind of my big overarching definition. Uh, spirituality is embracing, celebrating, and voicing all the connections with the ultimate mystery, the divine, within me and beyond me, in experiences that give me meaning, purpose, direction, and values for my daily journey. Spirituality exists in our connection to other humans, our environment, and the unfolding universe beyond, and the transcendent. So we can kind of see it's kind of a big, broad concept, right? Okay. And, and actually, classes have a very difficult time defining what this is. They could spend a whole semester trying to define what spirituality is. But religion is a little more, we can kind of narrow it down a little bit more. So we can say that we know that religion comes from a, a root word that means to tie or hold together. Um, 
so it's a little bit more like formalized practices instead of formalized beliefs and practices of a, of a religious institution. So it's organized. It's, it's an organized institution, which has doctrine, rituals, programs, community organization. And often these beliefs and practices are expressed in ways that are um, denominational, so that you think about all the different um, types of churches, for example, or types of religions, for example. Um, cognitive, behavioral rituals, they have certain rituals that they follow in their practices, and they're public, they're kind of in, done in community. And one can be spiritual without being religious, okay? And, and many, many, many of my students say, well, I don't really have a formal re uh, church that I attend, or I don't espouse or affiliate with a formal religion. But I see myself as a spiritual person. I see myself as concerned with the meaning of life, or being connected with others, or knowing that there's something beyond what I can see in front of me. And then some people can be religious without being spiritual. So. Um, for example, I have a, so, so you might think of somebody that belongs to a church, but mainly just for the social aspect. They like that feeling of connection, the feeling of belonging, the community. They do the practices, but they don't really think about in terms of, you know, what, what all this means or what the, what the faith beliefs are. Um, and some people can be both. Some people can be non-religious, period, and non-spiritual, period. So non-believers or atheists. So there's just all different categories. Um, one of my students considers himself a Jewish atheist. So he is an atheist, but his heritage is Judaism. He does go to synagogue once in a while. He takes his nephew once in a while. Um, he contributes money to the church. And so he has this religious connection, but he has no faith or belief in God whatsoever. His parents were killed in the Holocaust. So. You know, there, there can be overlap with these. So it's really important to clarify um, how these might be related to um, the count, your, yourself as a counselor, your perspective, and then to try to help your clients identify how are these concepts important for your clients? How do they make sense of them? Uh, there's kind of a new area. Anybody know much about transpersonal psychology? I'm just going to go over it real briefly. I don't know a lot about it, but I'm interested in it. Um, so it really kind of looks at um, integrating physical, emotional, and spiritual. We, call, we always talk about mind, body, spirit stuff, right? And the expansion of consciousness. And see, these are some of the um, uh, tenets that they look at or some of the concepts that people have said that they um, have experienced, past life experiences or out of body experiences or I just went to a conference um, for counselor educators and one of the sessions was on near-death experiences where the woman had uh, been studying Jan Hill from University of North Texas near-death experiences for over 30 years and it was fascinating to hear video clips of people chronicling their near-death experience. So it's an approach to healing and growth that looks at multiple levels. So they talk about the pre-personal is the experiences you had in the womb before you were even born, and then what happens personally inside you, and then what happens beyond in the unseen world. And it looks at unfolding awareness is, is important. And then awakening, they talk about awakening or transformation of consciousness, um, and facilitates uh, this process of transformation by um, really uh, invoking intuition and, and deeper awareness through such techniques as uh, body work. Um, a lot of the somatic therapies seem to be the current trend, uh, of current evolution that we're seeing in um, psychotherapy. Meditation, um, imagery and dream work, and altered states of consciousness with, with using breath work, for example. So this is kind of like a state-of-the-art evolution that that we're beginning to see. And so what we know is that there really has been a neglect of religion and spirituality in clinical practice. So where did that come from anyway? There's kind of this connection between religion and spirituality and also this estrangement. It wasn't uncommon in the 16th century for uh, the churches to actually take care of the mentally ill. And so there was a very close connection. They considered themselves taking care of souls. Um, and then the term psychology and the field of psychology sort of emerged as a study of the human mind and soul or spirit 
And in fact, psyche actually means um, the soul or mind of a person. So the root word of psychology means the soul or mind of a person. We've um, always had this conflict between science and religion, or fact versus faith, or what can be seen versus what is unseen, what is seen in the natural world versus what is unseen in the uh, supernatural world. And then all of you have studied Freud forever now, and so you know that he really identified uh, patients that had a belief in any kind of religion or spiritual spirituality as pathological. He thought it just encouraged repression. So, and of course, he was the you know founding father of psychology, unless you consider William James. But so he had a huge impact. One of the reasons that uh, these fields split apart. And then for years, it was considered that really this was an area that was just um, domains of the clergy. Like we refer those those issues to, to clergy because there was a real sense in the early um, 20th century that experts would be the ones that you needed to consult, and clergy were considered experts in uh, religion and spirituality. And then really, until recently, um, there's been a lack of training. Counselors have not um, had much training. In fact, in, um, in the U.S. in 1994, KCREP accredited programs, which KCREP is kind of the gold standard of accreditation in the U.S. for counselor ed programs, only 25% of programs addressed these issues in their curriculum. It has raised uh, up to 52% to 2005. And then, you know, a another reason that there's lack of training is because counselors are really fearful about this. So counselor educators, therefore, are very fearful about introducing this topic. And we also have, you know, counselors have, we also have unresolved issues in our life, and we may have unresolved religious and spiritual issues. And so we're more likely to avoid them. And in fact, over 29% of counselors believe that um, really only uh, only 21 only 29 percent believe that you should address these issues in therapy. And then in terms of the therapists or counselors themselves, over 25% had negative past experiences with religion. So of course they don't want to introduce this topic into the therapy session. Okay, so let me breathe here. Um, like I said, we're trying to cover a whole class. Religion and spirituality. Uh, so why do we think this might be important? Well, we've got some demographic data to kind of back this up. And I try to do some Canadian statistics, which keep in mind I'm from Boise, Idaho in the U.S. Um, so 80, and I try to uh, actually put the two L's in counseling, but I know I missed a lot of places, and I know I didn't write. I know I didn't the U, the, the U in behavior. It's like, oh, I forgot to do that. Okay, so help me out when, when I've been uh, culturally insensitive, as some people have to me out. Okay, so 80% uh, of Canadians say they believe in God. Okay. Um, however, 16% say they have no religion at all. And in BC, we kind of have a higher percentage than um, all of Canada. So I don't know if you were aware of that or not. And so church attendance is very much down in BC. I just read an article um, in one of your local um, uh, newspapers and, and magazines that said, really, um, in British Columbia, seems to be following the trend that Europe is following now in terms of religious affiliation. But I would still posit that there's an interest in spirituality. And in fact, in one survey uh, done at Carleton University, 51% of people, so students, these were students, said they believed in heaven, 54% life after death, and 50% uh, expressed belief in religion and miracles. So this is one of the reasons, most likely, in your practice sometime, you are going to be dealing with a client that has some kind of belief or faith system or espouses to spiritual values. One of the reasons it's important to include. Both disciplines really have uh, common goals. They have the goal of transformation of the mind and the emotions and the behaviors. And um, they both foster a sense of identity and give meaning to life, provide rituals that transform and connect, provide social support networks, support families. We're all about supporting families. That's my whole family counseling class. Uh, facilitate positive change. We want personal growth and, and development, right? And looking out for the physical and emotional welfare of members. So there are common interest areas, common values for religion and um, psychology. I knew uh, citing some empirical evidence was going to be important when I came here. 
So um, I, I looked at many, many studies, and I decided just to quote to you kind of a meta study that was done in 2001 by Koenig. He looked at 850 studies and um, have, that have shown a positive relationship between a religious involvement and mental health. And you keep seeing these studies every day. You can see it in the headlines. You can see it in the newspapers. You see it in the magazines. Um, they found that 79 of 100 studies um, reported sig uh, significantly uh, higher life satisfaction, more positive affect, and greater happiness uh, when there was religious or spiritual satisfaction. And 10 of 12 studies found positive relationship between spiritual involvement and well-being. So I just kind of wanted to report that to you, and I think there's oh, no, one, more, one more slide on that. I've been doing some initial pilot studies with school counselors, um, and um, um, multiple sclerosis patients and cancer patients with yoga nidra meditation, just very, just pilot studies, just beginning studies. And we've also found um, a, a correlation between um, so that particular practice, yoga nidra meditation, and um, well, a sense of well-being. So, um, and, and, and there's being research, more and more research is being done every day. Also, another uh, relationship between uh, spirituality and, and psychology is psychotherapy's pioneers actually did include this. And so Frank Parsons was the father of guidance, and he really thought that one of the things that guidance counselors, I don't know if you remember the term guidance counselors, uh, was to impart moral development and moral character among, um, among the clients and among the students. And Carl Jung looked at awareness uh, in, and, and he thought that that was um, awareness of the holy assisting in individuation. Eric Erickson looked at all the developmental life stages and he thought that spirituality and religion could help with trust in the very beginning of life, and could also help with wisdom in the later stages of life. And then you, you all know Abraham Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, and when he looked at the peak experiences, after he actually had already developed his model, he added a spiritual component to that as part of the peak experiences. And then Viktor Frankl with his um, search for meaning. So. Um, we do kind of have this background of, even though it began with the negative association and the pathology of Freud, we have, set, have had innovators and pioneers that have said, no, wait a minute, there, there's more to the person than just what you see sitting in front of you. In addition, we've seen some paradigm shifts and some cultural movements. So, and you all know about postmodernism. I know you know that, and social construction theory. And it just regards, uh, involves a shift about how we think about things. And, not looking at absolutes, but knowing that there are multiple perspectives and multiple ways of seeing things. And the implication that this has for us is that our clients' uh, religious or spiritual beliefs can be considered human constructions. And so it's important for us to enter into our clients' subjective realm and to try to work within whatever perspective they are bringing to us. And then we've got some more cultural shifts. We've got kind of alt alternative medicine is a big theme, right? Um, natural healing has set the stage for, for looking at wellness and well-being. We've got this emphasis on holistic approaches that look at um, body, mind, spirit. We've got self-help groups like the 12-step um, programs and the surge of interest in Eastern religions and philosophy. So I have an interest in some of all of these things, and I went, some of my students have told me about the greatest, most fun bookshops to go to here in Vancouver. So I went to Banyan <laughs> Bookstore, yes, yes, last week, and then I went to Victoria Friday, and I went to Monroe Books and discovered all of these topics, and it was so exciting. So we kind of have this whole cultural, cultural movement. And then all of this uh, postmodernism and social construction has kind of led into this multicultural context. So we're kind of seeing this as the fourth force in um, counseling and psychotherapy, uh, multiculturalism. And um, it's important to be able to work within clients' ethnic and cultural backgrounds. In fact, it's listed in our code of ethics, in all the American Counseling Association code of ethics, and also the Canadian Counseling and Psychotherapy Association. Did I get that right? I looked it up, CCPA. Okay. Um, because for many clients um, that come from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds, religion and spirituality is a huge 
part of their belief system. And then we just kind of can think of culture in overall ways, including all of these variabilities, but notice that religion is one of them. Okay. So I'm just kind of trying to set the stage. Um, it's real important when we think about integrating spirituality and religion into counseling to consider a person of the therapist issues. Um, the process of becoming a counselor is it's not all about just learning techniques and approaches and you learn this one, two, three step and you go in and you fix the problem, right? It's about becoming a person. It's about growing and making a commitment towards becoming a professional, continuing your education, pract practicing ethically, and becoming a whole person yourself. Um, and so what we know is that when we begin to touch on spiritual and religious issues with our clients, some, some of these concerns that they might bring in can be triggers for us. So, for example, some therapists may have experienced sexual abuse by clergy. Uh, they may have certain family of origin beliefs about religion. Maybe you, uh, the family of origin is totally adamant, adamantly atheist against religion. It's non-scientific. Or you may see that a client has liberal or even orthodox views that differ from their family of origin beliefs. And so all of these kind of come into play, and if you have any of these in your life, it can trigger um, how you might relate to some of the concerns. The significant losses um, might be triggered, trans so, and maybe a Okay, and I've seen this with my students. They've gone to a weekend workshop. Maybe it was on breast therapy or, or some you know, new esoteric, whatever the latest body-centered tapping thing is or whatever, and they're so excited. They feel like they've experienced a higher, an altered state of consciousness. And they come back in, and they want to share that with their clients, right? Well, is that, is that going to be useful or not? So here's just a case example. Um, of a person of the therapist. So I just want you to consider this. What, what issues do you think might be um, coming forward as a person of the therapist issue? So Isabel's counseling Nadine. She needs assistance with um, her boyfriend's pressure to start attending church. She's, uh, Nadine's Jewish, not interested in uh, Christianity. Um, Isabel, the counselor, was raised Catholic, but um, had very strong what we might consider feminist views or social justice views. And um, what Isabel did with, with Nadine was to really focus on these gender issues and um, to tell, to have Nadine be very assertive regarding her, um, her opinion, Nadine's opinion, no matter what the boyfriend thought. And even though Nadine was quite concerned that her, she may lose her boyfriend if she doesn't join his church, but Isabel didn't focus on that. So what person of the therapist issues do you think might be coming forward here? See them. I heard a little voice. Her issue. <laughs> yeah, it's her stuff, right? It's her stuff. She's projecting her stuff onto it. So that's just kind of a simple example. You know? Think about that. So I mean it's her agenda, right? It's not focusing on what the needs of the client are. Okay. So that's an example. Um, one of the things that we find useful, there are several models of, um, of, develop, of um, uh, religious and spiritual development, and most of them are lifespan models, and it can be useful for the client to understand what um, stage of development of faith their client is so that they know how to create that intervention. And there are several different models, and I just wanted to point out one to you that might, that might be useful. Um, this is a developmental model that's growth-oriented that, that can be used to understand a client's spiritual or religious journey. And it looks, it looks, looks at stages of spiritual development. It tries to identify um, developmental crises and transitions um, and, and allows the counselor to kind of diagnose and assess the nature of the role of a per person's faith apart from the specific Belief. So like, really, what role is the faith playing now? And what developmental stage are they in? So what belief system might that they have? And that, how is this affecting their concerns? So I just really wanted you to know that there are um, developmental models, and there are about actually five or six of them that, that we love that have pretty good um, uh, information. 
Another thing that we want to do is we need to assess what the um, client's uh, worldviews are and assess their religious and spiritual beliefs and values. And, um, there's a lot of reasons we want we want to do that. We need to understand their worldviews so that we're not making faulty assumptions, right? We need to find out are their faith communities a good fit or um, are there problems and barriers to their being participa participants in a faith community? Um, an example of, of that, for example, might be um, gay and lesbian clients not feeling comfortable going to a specific church and being part of that community. Um, we need to understand how guilty the clients feel. You know, religion and spirituality is not always positive. It has also been extremely harmful in people's lives, and people often come to counseling just because of that, and perhaps even because of the guilt that they may feel. And so, uh, we need to assess kind of what they're actually, what they know, what what their beliefs and, and um, values are when they try to adhere to a particular religious belief system. Do they really understand what that is, what is that about, or how are they interpreting things? And we always want to facilitate. Um, exploration, of course, and so we're going to look at all of, all of these things, the beliefs, values, spiritual practices, so how can um, those enable clients to be proactive in owning, or do they need to change or make some new decisions or take charge of their life in a new way? So we need to assess that. Um, we're going to try to diagnose if there's a, a particular concern. Again, we want to look at uh, religion and spirituality as resources. We need to assess the degree of health or pathology, and that's kind of a big one. We need to know, is religion and spirituality um, a problem for them? And then we need to diagnose and assess to, uh, a to determine appropriate intervention. So they're all kind of assessments. Um, they are just intake forms where we kind of ask. I know, for example, my I just changed doctors recently, and for the first time ever, on the form it said, what is your religion or what is your religious affiliation? It's like, nobody's ever asked me that before. That might be useful sometime in my treatment, right? So we can just ask, you know, what was the family of origins? What's the current religious religion or religious affiliation? How much do they participate? Are they satisfied? Are they aware, are, are they aware of any resources that can be used uh, to help overcome? So you can actually ask these questions on intake forms, and I have seen Richards and Bergen uh, Spiritual Strategies book has excellent examples of uh, therapist intake forms that you can ask in a private clinical practice. You can also just ask them. You can talk about it, right? So you can say, think back to the question I asked you initially, what is your source of strength and hope? Uh, you can just say, are there any religious or spiritual practices that are important to you? Okay. Um, what role does religion or spirituality play in your life? Oftentimes, depending on what you might see on the actual um, intake form, that can be uh, a, a, a gauge to what questions you might want to ask in the interview. And so, you know, you can kind of expand whatever you see on the intake form. So, you know, how can you draw on your spiritual or religious practices to help? And then just the, um, to me, the, one of the ultimate questions, what gives you meaning and purpose in life? And a lot of times clients are just coming for that very thing. They don't know. Right? So we can talk about it. We can process it. But um, we can have them do a spiritual genogram. I just had my class do a family of origin genogram. But this is just, um, this has been developed as a tool in Bohemian family therapy, and now we can transfer it to uh, spirituality and counseling, where you just map out kind of a family tree, uh, what the demographic information has been from your family, from your nuclear family, to your grandparents, to your great-grandparents. And so what, what have been the family dynamics, and what have been the uh, transmission of family patterns and belief systems, and how does that continue to affect your current beliefs and practices? So then looking at yourself in terms of spiritual family dynamics or religious family dynamics. So that's one tool that can be used that can be quite useful. And then we've got a lot of paper and pencil instruments. So um, I actually have, after the, the talk is over, I actually have three of these on the table here if you want to take a look. Um, I have the spiritual assessment inventory, and this is good for looking from a Judeo-Christian perspective. The in-spirit um, has a uh, 
just stimulates discussion, really. And, and just how close do you feel to God what is one question on it. Another question is, how often have you felt as though you were very close to a powerful spiritual force that seemed to, uh, that should be lift you outside yourself? Okay, so I ask questions like that. And again, I have copies of it here. And then spiritual well-being scale has been around for, and is quite well, well known. Um, should say spiritual religious well-being. Okay, life doesn't have much meaning is a question on it. Or my relationships with God, or my relationship with God helps me to not feel lonely. So just some examples that you can, if you want to go to the formalized route of using a paper and pencil instrument. And then um, spiritual health inventory examples are, um, I have a sense of internal support or strength in dealing with illness. I experience a sense of awe when I consider life and the universe. And then there's more. There are even some for um, addictions work that you can use to assess the role of spirituality and religion in their life. And the, we're, we're finding more and more of these are coming out all the time. So I did want you to know that there actually are some instruments that, that can be useful. So um, we kind of need to think about in terms of harmful or, or pathological. So how does the belief system affect uh, the client's functioning? So for example, if a client believes in reincarnation and becomes a strict vegetarian, that's not such a big deal, right? There's really no harm in that. However, think of a second example. A client believes she's going to spend eternity in hell because of her sins. Hmm. So maybe some neurotic thinking, maybe some cognitive restructuring might be necessary. Um, it's pretty easy when we can look at readily diagnosable causes, right? For example, uh, a, a psychotic client thinks that he or she's the Buddha or the Virgin Mary. You know, that's pretty. We, we can figure that out. But what if it's not so clear? What if the manifestations and how it affects a client's life, it's not quite that clear? So Klein Bell came up with 14 criteria. And um, I'm not going to read them all, but I just want to give you a sample. Um, he said, so what we want to think about is, do the religious or spiritual beliefs, attitudes, and practices, for example, give people meaning and hope in the face of tragedies, um, provide for a renewal of sense of trust and belonging in the universe? I'm just going to have you kind of look at these to know that there are 14 of them. Foster self-esteem. Provide trust and hope in the face of loss. Move from guilt. I'm not sure if I have another slide on them or not. Okay, so here's an example of how we might use assessment um, of um, spiritual and religious values or, or um, concerns, beliefs. So Diana was, um, began practicing Buddhism in college. She took this very seriously. Uh, she came to counseling just to really to work on family issues, anger at her father, right? And um, the counselor, Martin, found that she had religious beliefs and practices. And um, he found this not only through the intake form, but the clinical interview, okay? And, uh, he noted that she experienced meditation as a force for renewal, and she had a faith circle that gave her a lot of social support. And so what was his conclusion? That this was a pretty healthy aspect, right? Okay. And this could be a resource that they could use as she discussed and looked back at her family of origin issues, she could use the, this belief system as a strength of support. Then I wanted to just briefly touch on uh, uh, implicit strategies and explicit strategies. So implicit strategies just mean that you come from a position of holding the question. You know, is spirituality and religion um, important? But it doesn't outline any specific practices other than um, uh, coming from a specific theory, but just trying to have an attitude that you would be open to discussing this concern or question with the client in session. But there are some thorny issues to think about. And one of these is that invariably the client may ask you what your practice or what your belief system is. And how do you handle that? How do you handle counseling self-disclosure? And that is that important? 
And one response might be to think about it just in terms of kind of deferring the response and trying to find out why it's important to them. And we always talk about that in, um, in issues that come up in, in the sessions, right? We don't, but if we are clearly and directly asked, so are you a Christian, and you've already tried this response, it is totally appropriate to say yes, because we really are not, um, we, we do have values, right? We are value laden, and can you really come to a session without your, without your values? Um, it's important to really consider working with clients' religious or spiritual authorities, in fact, to make referrals to or to for you to consult for information regarding specific uh, religious or spiritual issues. So maybe that you kind of want to have a, a notebook of um, referrals or contacts that you could consult your local rabbi for the beliefs regarding this client or, or your local Catholic priest um, in the black church. That's a huge piece of um, clients' uh, spirituality. So actually including them in the counseling sessions, the, the preachers, might be quite useful. Um, we definitely know there's some harmful beliefs and practices, right, that we have to take direct action. So if a, if a client comes and says they hear God telling them to commit murder, what are we going to do? Yeah? What are we going to do, everybody? We're going to report that, right? We're going to, yeah, it's important. Take action. Okay. And so if clients consider that, you know, sexual abuse might be a, of children might be a spiritual practice, and you, they tell us that, what are we concerned with here? What, what's the overriding concept? Everybody knows yeah. imminent danger, right? Yeah. And so we're, we, we must report. We have a duty to report. So think about that. So here's an example of, uh, of, of looking at how you might be able to uh, uh, bring, the, bring this together. So Leah was a 42-year-old, came to counseling. She was Jewish. She was being sexually harassed. She was worried she'd lose her job if she reported, of course. She was very shy and withdrawn. Um, and um, in the session they learned she was Jewish and that was the basis for her whole community and so I think that the counselor was really smart. Amy probably was not Jewish but she probably consulted a rabbi who mm -hmm. said you know we have a rich prophetic tradition here. Um, we talk about prophets and so Amy was able to use this to, to mm -hmm. say hey they, they got up and they spoke up about social injustice. Think of yourself as a prophet and when she could put herself in that mindset with some cognitive restructuring, right, okay, then um, she could challenge and, and report that assessment. So this is the one way that this could, could be very useful in the session. And then we've got our explicit strategies, um, which are, you know, pretty self-evident. Prayer, many of your clients will practice prayer. It's not uncommon for therapists who have religious beliefs to pray for their clients. However, praying in session is quite controversial and I would discourage it. If the client wants to pray, say, I would be happy to follow you as you lead us in prayer if, that, if they want to do that. But it's very controversial and I don't think it's a good practice. I've never done it myself. Um, so, you know, prescribing or helping them learn con con contemplative methods or meditation. Experiential focusing is a new uh, technique that's being used by, it started with Gendler and um, Elsie Hinterkopf is the one that has been using it in the counseling area. Uh, but just to um, use it as an inquiry if you're having pain in a part of your body to get in a, a, a relaxed state and just um, feel that feeling in the body and ask a question, so what, what are, why are you here, what are you trying to teach me, that's experiential focusing, and Cashwell and Young have been doing um, a lot of um, research in that area. So, and then some of these others are just quite self-evident. Um, seeking spiritual direction, I have um, a friend, um, Nancy, who has seen a, a psychologist for, for years consulting her problems. She's a retired widowed woman uh, who was a counselor, by the way, career counselor. And she just felt like that in her counseling sessions, it was great as far as it went, but um, it never included the spiritual realm of her life. Um, she happens to be very active in the Catholic Church of Benedictine Oblate, and she felt like she was missing. So she sought spir a spiritual director. She found a spiritual director. So that's just one example. Um, 
The idea of surrender often used as guided imagery to help a person understand that maybe there really are things you can't control in your life and to try to let them go. And then 12-step programs are, are, of course, huge. Um, but there really are some contraindications. We don't always want to use spiritual intervention. So um, if the client isn't interested in using that, um, or if the, it's not relevant to the problem, or if the client is psychotic or delusional. Um, and I really want to underscore this publicly funded uh, schools or agencies, secular schools or agencies. Um, I really discourage, I train school counselors in our master's program, and I really discourage them from bringing this in as a topic unless the student brings it up. And if the student brings it up and wants to explore that, I get informed consent from the parent to be able to do this. So I just really want you to think about that. There are really so so where are we going to use some of these spiritual interventions? Most likely in private practice settings and clinics. Okay, uh, residential treatment centers again, depending upon the body. And we know that spiritual interventions are less effective, and, and this is just true for counseling. It makes good sense. We know that. If there's not a strong bond or a strong therapeutic alliance, it's not going to be as effective. Um, if the counselor and client really have different or divergent religious or spiritual values, most clients will tell you that they're more comfortable working with a counselor that has um, uh, a religion similar to theirs or a spiritual belief similar to theirs. And then a counselor who's not sensitive to multicultural, religious, and spiritual diversity. And again, keeping in mind that um, working with, with diversity is extremely, um, it's a responsibility that we have. And this is just another way to add to that sensitivity. And there really are some ethical considerations. As I mentioned, uh, uh, ethical codes um, all, talk about, all talk about these. They all talk about the welfare of the client. You know, what's in the best interest of the client. Giving informed consent is extremely important when you're working with spiritual and religious issues. And so in, if you're in private practice and this is something that you want to bring in the session, say it right there in, in, in your informed consent um, piece so that they know that you might be using spiritual interventions if they would like to have that happen. Um, we don't want to work outside our, you know, a lot of these you kind of know. It's important not to impose our values. Um, we have to be very careful with multiple or dual relationships or non-professional relationships is the way American Counseling Association talks about it now. So is it appropriate, for example, if um, you're a therapist and you're a member of a church and another church member says, I would like to see you for counseling? So we have to think about that. And how might it be appropriate or how would it not be appropriate? Or what if you're um, clergy member comes to you and says, you know, I know you have a practice, private practice, and I've got this um, member in our church who has come to me, and I'm just certain that you could help with this. So would there be any ethical issues around that? So kind of important to think about. It could be. Actually, it could be if, there, if it was clarified. And um, we're all going to run into multiple relationships, especially in rural areas. You're just not going to get away from it. So how do you manage it? to me is the key. Um, again, we talk about work setting boundaries and, and public funds. It's extremely important if you don't know to consult and refer, you, you know that. Um, and again, we've got personal therapist issues that really come out. It's important. You have to know your own belief system. That's extremely important. And I imagine in our program, we have our students write a nature of people. Theory, uh, paper, how they think people come to change, how they think people develop, how they, what their worldview is. You need to explore these issues in terms of your beliefs and spirituality and counseling if you're going to bring this into your practice. Um, and again, that unfinished business, we could, and we want to make sure that we're not, like, if we have a certain religious practice, we don't want to try to convert people to that, right? We don't want to proselytize, and we don't want to just inadvertently discourage, because when we don't talk about it, when we don't even ask the question, most of the times our clients assume that we think that that's not important to us, and it's not pertinent to their concern. Um, here's just a, a, a simple example, again, of a person of a therapist issue. So. He was, the counselor was in a residential treatment facility, and he had his own issues as a child of an alcoholic. And so he learned meditation, transcendental meditation. 
and um, he was working with a 15-year-old boy who was angry at the world and uh, especially um, angry at his father. He'd stolen a car. The counselor's belief is that finding a spiritual path is going to fix this boy and um, that he just needs to lessen his pain and find peace through meditation. Okay? The boy doesn't want anything to do with that crap. Right? Mm -hmm. He's 15, right? Okay, so what's happening in this situation? What's happening? The counselor's trying to relive his own yeah. life through this client, right? So is that in the best interest of the client? <laughs> is that the welfare of the client? Okay, or is that a person of therapist issue that the counselor needs to come to terms with these issues? Okay, so I just wanted to be kind of, so, ooh, look at the time, okay. So, in summary of a whole three credit class, really, <laughs> the, ther the therapist's attitude toward a client's spiritual or, or belief system can have a significant impact on the counseling outcomes. And um, counselors' willingness to attend to faith can build rapport and lessen potential resistance with clients who are religious or have spiritual values. So that's kind of my summary and just wanted to kind of go back to the beginning and have you think, so why should we integrate spirituality and religion into counseling? And I hope that I've given you enough reasons to think about it. <laughs> yes, and maybe yeah. I've even given your department a reason to think about, huh, yes. we should have a spirituality and counseling class. <laughs> maybe they'll consider that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe they'll invite me back to teach yes, that class, right? right? <laughs> yeah. And so these are some of the references that I use. I use uh, Marcia uh, Frame's book, Integrating Religion, Spirituality, and Counseling Textbook. I <laughs> just wanted you to know, I really did reference and research this. And then I always think about, for me, what religion and spirituality involve, uh, uh, the meaning and purpose of life. And I love this poem by Mary Oliver. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Thank you very much for allowing me to spend this time.